Thanks for coming back. So it's antihistamines part two. Let's talk about the indications. So we use them in the management of our nasal allergies. We'll use them in seasonal or perennial allergic rhinitis. Our allergic reactions, motion sickness, Parkinson's disease, and sometimes in sleep disorders. Remember, they have that sedative effect to a varying degree. They can also be used to relieve the symptoms associated with the common cold. That's sneezing, runny nose, but remember again, palliative treatment, not curative. So symptomatic, really. When we look at the levels of efficacy of our medications, we can see that there's different effects that occur with different medications. So our antihistamine efficacy compared to our anticholinergic activity versus our sedative or the sedation portion. So you'll see our highest sedative is our diphenhydramine or the Benadryl, with our lowest being the loratadine or the fexofenadine. And when we look at these, you'll see why in just a few minutes. I have another graphic that we'll discuss briefly. But the antihistamines do have some adverse effects. Remember, the anticholinergic effects are the most common ones that can be troublesome. That's our dry mouth, our difficulty urinating. So we would want to give this to a geriatric man who already has perhaps uh, some problems urinating, maybe from some prosthetic hypertrophy. Um, we also don't want to give them to someone who maybe has a problem with constipation. Maybe they're taking another medication that's constipating. Also, we have to be careful with changes in vision. If we have patients who are taking medications for vision problems, we want to make sure that we don't double with this anticholinergic effect. And then the drowsiness. It can be mild drowsiness to causing a deep sleep. So we have these two types of antihistamines when we're looking at the antihistamines for the H1 receptors. And those are the ones, remember, that we usually refer to as antihistamines, although technically the H1, H2, H3, or H4 are all antihistamines. So when we look at these two types, we have traditional, and then we have what we call our non-sedating or our peripherally acting. Our traditional antihistamines are the older antihistamines. Now, they work both peripherally and centrally. They do have the anticholinergic effects, making them more effective than our non-sedating drugs in some cases. So, for example, the diphenhydramine or the chlorpheniramine or chlortrimeton, we may choose to use those if we want that sedating effect. Our non-sedating, our peripheral acting antihistamines were developed specifically to eliminate those unwanted adverse effects, mainly the sedation. Because obviously, if you have seasonal allergies or you have some sort of a condition that you are sneezing, you can't take this sedating medication and drive or go to work and things like that. So it, became, it can become quite um, prohibitive. So the way the non-sedating, those peripherally acting antihistamines work is that they peripherally block the action of the histamine. So they have this lo much lower central nervous system adverse effect. They also have a longer duration of action. And because of that, you have increased compliance. These are the things like Allegra, Loratadine, you'll hear of it as uh, Claritin or uh, Cetirizine, which is Zyrtec. And when we look at the classifications of these H1 antagonists, you can see that we have the first generation. They all have a marked potential, a marked potential for producing sedation. And we will see some of them used to treat motion sickness. Most often we'll see meclizine. You see that down uh, second to the bottom. We'll see that used for uh, vertigo or for inner ear problems or a condition called BPPV, which is benign positional, excuse me, benign paradoxical positional vertigo, BPPV. And um, we will see promethazine sometimes used for nausea. Um, we don't see that often anymore because of some other effects that it has. Um, then our second generation, they are the ones that have the weak potential for producing the sedation with the non-sedating being our loratadine, the fexofenadine, and 
the desloratadine. So when we're looking at all these medications, what do we care in terms of, or what are we concerned with in terms of nursing implications? Well, we want to be sure we gather data about the condition, is the allergic reaction the, or the condition that required treatment. Also, we want to assess for drug allergies. Now, these medications are contraindicated in the presence of acute and, uh, asthma attacks. And remember, lower respiratory diseases such as pneumonias, we don't want to use them. Most of them are well absorbed following oral administration and they're metabolized by the liver. However, remember they cannot knock that histamine off of the, hist the receptor site once it's there. And they can, because of their anticholinergic effect, cause increased viscosity of the fluids and the mucus, thereby causing that to be a contraindication in our lower respiratory diseases. We we'll also use them with caution in our, uh, when our patient has intraocular pressure, cardiac or renal disease, uh, hypertension, asthma, COPD, peptic ulcer, in our um, BPH or pregnancy, in our geriatric patient, the antihistamine is going to be more likely to cause excessive sedation, which can lead to syncope, dizziness, confusion, and even hypotension. So we will start with a very low dose if an antihistamine is necessary. In our pediatrics, they diminish the mental alertness. So they can produce also in small children a what's called a paradoxical excitation syndrome. So this, the patient actually becomes excited. They may hallucinate. They may become uh, uncoordinated. They may have some muscle twitching. Um, they can develop a higher fever, hyperreflexia, and even cyanosis. If this occurs, that can be followed by respiratory depression or depression and cardiorespiratory arrest. So um, if you give antihistamines in very small children, those convulsions can be preceded by this mild depression, and that is not a good prognosis when that occurs. So the convulsant dose of antihistamines in a pediatric patient is near the lethal dose. So that's why you will see the cautions on the antihistamines not to give to children under the age of two. Um, pregnancy categories, now we know that these are changing. Pregnancy categories are now being labeled in the new system, but they've typically been a pregnancy category B for the diphenhydramine, the chlorophenazine, the tyrosine, and the loratadine with a category C for the fexofenadine. Um, that's because the safety for use in pregnancy has not really been well established. Um, there's several possible associations with malformation that have been found. Uh, but we don't know really the significance. And we don't use them during the third trimester of pregnancy because the newborn or the premature infant, if they're born, can have some severe reactions. So what about patient education? Well, we want to make sure that the patient knows that they're to report excessive sedation, confusion, hypotension. They should be instructed to avoid driving, operating heavy machinery, they should be advised not to use alcohol, other sleeping pills or CNS depressants, any sedatives or tranquilizers. Because they have this sedative effect, they can cause drowsiness. So, um, this, and dizziness, dry mouth, all of those things that could place them at risk if they're going to be um, using a car, driving a car, or doing anything like that. Um, they're typically stored in a tightly closed container in a cool, dry place. And always, always, always remember, keep these medications out of the reach of children. Instruct them not to take these medications with other prescribed medications or over-the-counter medications unless they're check checking that out with the prescribers. Some of the antihistamines can cause GI upset, so they're best tolerated when taken with meals. That will help reduce it. However, loratadine, it's the loratadine should be taken on an empty stomach at least two hours after or one hour before a meal. Antihistamines can also cause um, photosensitivity, so we want to avoid prolonged sunlight exposure with these. And patients, of course, would be told not to um, chew the pill or anything like that. They may want to uh, chew gum if dry mouth occurs. They could suck on hard candy 
uh, pre preferably sugarless, to ease the discomfort. Um, and we want to then monitor for the intended therapeutic effect because antihistamines can sometimes become less effective. Patients can develop a, a less effective um, tolerance or the tolerance can occur. So if the patient requires two antihistamines for severe symptoms, then the prescriber usually uses two drugs from different classes. So that's all about antihistamines. We're going to come back and next we'll talk about the decongestants. See you in a few minutes.